Okay. Um, so we're very happy to have um, Justin Hilburn from the Perimeter Institute here today to talk to us about two categorical 3D mirror symmetry. So uh, take it away, Justin. Okay, thank you. Um, so everything I'm gonna talk about is joint work with uh, Ben Gamage and Aaron Maselge. Uh, Benji and I like had sort of like a dumb idea of like how we were gonna prove this theorem um, and it ran into insurmountability, insurmountable infinity categorical difficulties. <laughs> but Aaron straightened them all out. So this actually, we, we do know how to prove everything I'm gonna, gonna talk about today. Um, and uh, a lot of this stuff that I'm, that I'm gonna talk about arose out of discussions with uh, Tudor. Uh, you know, he, we had a project on knot homology and uh, we needed, um, we needed to sort of dip into the two categorical um, structure a little bit. Um, and so this was kind of my attempt to answer um, some questions that we came up with together. Um, okay, so let me just do a brief bit of review, um, but since Matt gave a, Matt and Sam both gave a series of lectures on these things, I'm gonna move pretty quickly through this beginning part. Um, so if you have a 3DN equals four gauge theory, um, it's well known that it has uh, two topological twists, one of which I'm gonna call the 3DA model. Um, and the other one is uh, the 3DB model or the rosansky witten twist. Um, and I'm just gonna make one small remark that I would normally skip over, but since Sam uh, gave a bunch of talks, uh, I just wanna uh, just quickly explain like how his talks are related to this. Um, so it turns out that these 3D n equals four theories have like a further holomorphic topological twist, which is only defined on manifolds that admit a transverse holomorphic foliation. So basically the, your standard example would be a three manifold that's like a product of a complex um, curve times like a times like a real one manifold. Um, and it's basically possible to define um, variants of the 3D A model and B model, which are also only defined on these um, THF manifolds. And like the terminology that I like to use is I like to call these things like the Durham, um, the Durham twists. Um, and these things uh, give rise to these algebraic field theories that Sam was talking about in his talk. But in particular, um, so in some ways they're like a little bit easier because like you have this holomorphic structure around which lets us use algebraic geometry to control things. Uh, but in some sense, they're a little bit harder because you can only take them down to uh, line operators. You can like the best you can go is like, look at what they assign to a punctured disc. Um, and that's like a, usually like a very infinite dimensional type of object. Um, and anyway, so Sam gave a bunch of talks uh, talking about this idea. But in this case, we're actually gonna talk about the full uh, 3D twists that are defined on arbitrary three manifolds. Um, and these things uh, are actually give rise to fully extended functorial field theory. Here, we're gonna lose our connection, at least on one side to algebraic geometry. Um, but here you can go deeper in categorical level and try and ask like what two categories do these field theories um, assign to a point? Sorry, I wrote field, field theories. Um, and then afterward, what we're gonna try and do is um, see whether we can verify 3D mirror symmetry. Um, and in both cases, I'm gonna be able to give like a true, like an answer to both of these questions, like in the abelian setting. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and uh, get started. So I think the, the most well-known of these two twists is the rosansky witten twist or the 3DB model. And uh, it was analyzed, or the two category of boundary conditions for this theory was analyzed in a lot of detail by Kapustin, Rosansky, and Solana. And roughly like the answer that we have is that if you have uh, X, some sort of derived symplectic stack, so this is maybe more generality than they would have used, um, then there should be a two category, which I'll call KRS of X, 
which has objects consisting of pairs L and curly L, where L is a derived Lagrangian in X, and curly L is some quasi-coherent sheet of categories on um, the Lagrangian L. Uh, and then the way that you compute the morphisms in this uh, two category is roughly you intersect the two Lagrangians, and then now you can restrict both of your sheaves of categories to the intersection, take the HOM in the category, in the two category of quasi-coherent sheaves of categories, and then take global sections. So this is sort of like a rough idea. Um, if you actually like end up like trying to investigate this thing, you find that there's um, like a lot of details that this doesn't uh, encompass. The first thing is that um, really this theory is usually only um, Z mod 2 Z graded. So the Z cohomological grading that you're used to on, on a derived category like really only collapses to Z mod 2 grading. Um, and so that means that I can actually just allow any uh, even shifted symplectic stack as my X. Um, and then like actually there's like a bunch of, you really actually want to like impose some equivalence relations on your Lagrangians that have to do with things like nor periodicity for matrix factorizations. Like this thing isn't like really like quite um, like a well-defined uh, definition. And to my knowledge, even when your um, stack is just the cotangent bundle to something, uh, that there's really no fully satisfactory mathematical construction of the KRS um, two category. Um, like that doesn't, there are like two kind of like approximations that people use that give you like some handle on it. Um, and the first one is like the original like KRS proposal, which has been used a lot by Rosansky and Oblomkov. Um, and they have this a model in terms of, um, they basically, instead of using derived Lagrangians, they basically use um, Lagrangians together with like boundary matter um, and a super potential. Um, and then they use this to get like various matrix factorization categories. This is like a very concrete model um, and it's good for doing certain kinds of calculations, but you basically can't verify like any of the formal properties of the model. Like it's difficult to show it's a category or it's a two category. Uh, like there's just like lots of, um, yeah, it's basically it, it, like proving any theoretical properties of this model is very difficult. Um, and then the other like big proposal is uh, Arinkin has proposed a certain Z-graded lift, which is known as the two category of incoherent sheaves of categories on, on the base Y. Um, and that's gonna be the model that I'm actually gonna follow. It has uh, sort of better formal properties, but I sort of think that it also doesn't quite give the, give the, give the correct answer in all circumstances. So, um, but it will for what I'm gonna do. So um, let me perhaps at this point is a good time to ask a question. We've um, got a question from Pranav about do we want any sheaves of categories or do we want sheaves of categories with Calabi Yao structure? Um, so I think that in the, their proposal, they do want that. Uh, for now, I'm just going to ignore subtleties like that um, uh, because I'm going to get down to a really concrete model in a little bit um, and it's not going to matter. Um, and I actually had one too. Um, so Rimkin's definition doesn't appear to use the symplectic structure at all, while your, the other two do. Um, is there any obvious way to see the other two are independent of the symplectic structure or? Well, a Rinkin's thing, Yeah, so Rinkin's thing is just using, one, it's defined on a different space, right? It's only defined on the base of the cotangent bundle, not on the cotangent bundle itself. So it's not defined on like an arbitrary manifold. Um, and I usually think of this cutting down as being kind of like in geometric quantization where you have to throw out half of your, um, half of your variables in order to get like a good Hilbert space. Um, and this like seems to like hold in the categorical setting as well. Um, so there's some good papers by like Pavel Safranov on this kind of thing. Um, but basically they recover the symplectic nature through this thing that we'll call, like that they call categorical singular support, uh, which I'll talk a tiny bit about later, which lets you see some, some bit of the symplectic structure. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question, Benedict?
Hello, are you guys still there? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry, like uh, your pictures uh, all froze and I was un uncertain. Okay, so let me try and um, tell you a little bit about uh, Arinkin's proposal for these coherent sheaves of categories. Um, but before I do that, I actually have to remind you as to what a quasi-coherent sheaf of categories is, as described by Gates Corey. Um, and so this proposal works in the following way. Um, so the first thing is that if you're studying a scheme Y, which is just affine, so it's a speck of some ring, then uh, we'll say that the, that the two category of quasi-coherent sheaves of categories, which I'm just going to describe as two co of Y, uh, that thing is just going to be the same thing as an A-linear uh, category. Um, in general, if you want to know what two Q co of, of some stack Y is, you should consider all of the maps from affine schemes into your stack Y, and then take the limit um, in infinity two categories of uh, two Q co of spec A. And then these, we know what they are, they're just A linear categories. So that's like a pretty, that's like a very formal definition, but it's pretty, uh, uh, it's not useful to compute with. Um, and then so two properties that they define that like actually let you uh, compute a little bit is that one, that this uh, 2Q co satisfies smooth descent. So what that lets you know is that if G is a smooth algebraic group, then uh, 2Q co of the classifying stack, um, or more generally, like you could work out a general quotient, is really just the thing, same thing as co-modules over quasi-coherent sheaves on the group. So the multiplication pullback under the multiplication makes Q co of G into a co-monoid. And then you can just ask for co-modules for that. Um, so that's like the first thing that makes this somewhat tractable. Um, and then the second thing that you can find uh, that'll make this category somewhat tractable is that just like for quasi-coherent sheaves where you can take global sections in order to get a module over the ring of global functions, or if you have a module over the ring of global functions, you can localize it to get a quasi-coherent sheaf. Um, there's actually like an adjunction, um, which takes you, the first one is global sections, which takes you from two Q co of Y to modules over uh, quasi-coherent sheaves on Y. So you should think of this thing as being like the two structure sheaf. And then the second one is localization, which tells you if you have something like Q co of Y mod uh, that you can get back a, um, a two quasi-coherent sheaf. And uh, for a definition, well, for ordinary schemes, we say that they're affine if the global sections functor is an equivalence. And so here we're gonna say that um, Y is one affine if the global section sphincter from two QCO is an equivalence. And then there's a theorem of gates Corey where he basically, or a paper of gates Corey is where he investigates um, which stacks are one affine. And in particular, what we'll use a bunch is that V mod G, uh, where V is a vector space and G is a reductive group is always one affine. So, so we have a very concrete model um, for, the, for this. Okay, so let me just do one example, um, which I, which will become very useful in the future, although it's not exactly clear why uh, right now. So uh, let's consider the map from a point, which we'll call EG, to point mod G, which we'll call BG. Um, and we can try and ask ourselves, what on earth is the two category of two Q co of BG? Um, so there's some particular objects uh, which are in there, which physicists would call Neumann and Dirichlet. Um, so this is appearing in the B-twisted pure 3D gauge theory. Um, and Neumann is the two structure sheaf of BG and Dirichlet is the two structure sheaf of EG. But we have two different ways now of like understanding this category concretely. So the first one um, is this one affineness condition. So that's this equivalence here, 
which tells you that if you take global sections, which is the same thing as homming out of Neumann, uh, that that is an equivalence. And under this equivalence, Neumann becomes quasi-coherent sheaves on BG, so just G reps. And then Dirichlet becomes backed. And then there's a second equivalence that you can look at, which comes from descent. Um, and roughly, this is that's given by Hom out of Dirichlet. Really, I have to use that Dirichlet is dualizable to get this. So it's not quite this, but it's close enough. Um, and under this equivalence, uh, Neumann becomes Vect, and Dirichlet becomes QCO quasi coherent sheaves on the group. Okay. Um, and then if we have any. Uh, any other stack V mod G living over BG, we can push forward the two structure sheaf of VG um, to get an object in two QCO of BG. And if I wanna see where that object goes, well, this is just a generalization of the previous two examples. If I uh, use one affineness, then I just get QCO of V mod G as a module over QCO of BG. And if I use the other equivalence, if I use descent, then I just get Q code V back. Um, so are there any questions about this before I move on? Uh, I'll explain the theorems in a second. Okay, so I guess not. Um, and so then there are these two theorems that are very useful, which are called gauging and ungaging. So the first one tells you that um, if you pair Dirichlet with uh, the two structure sheaf of V mod G, that should get rid of the G quotient, that should ungauge the theory. That should be Q co of V. But if you compute that in this side, if you compute it in uh, using one affineness, and that tells you that HOM in the category of modules over Q co of BG um, between VECT and Q co of V mod G, and that thing ought to be the same thing as V. So that tells you that you can basically get, if you knew Q code V mod G and you knew it's Q code VG action, it's telling you that you can recover Q code V so you can ungauge. And then the second one is gauging, which tells you, um, which is very similar, which tells you that if I knew Q code V, but with its structure of a Q code G co module, then I can compute this HOM and, and get the gauged theory. Okay, so any questions about this? So I have a quick question. Um, yes. It's a, just a technical question. You're working in presentable categories, right? And the functors are functors of presentable. Yes, but basically like from now on, I'm gonna constantly be passing between the presentable version and the, uh, and sometimes small, uh, like the compact objects. So I just like don't ever wanna make any uh, cl claims about that. Um, but it, like you're correct on this on this page, but I, I'm not going to be consistent. So is that going to need compact generation at some point? Are you or are you going to comment on? Yeah. That? So so here I'm working in presentable, and then generally I'm going to use yeah compactly generated stuff. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. I mean, if you want to talk more about it later, uh, we can. But basically, uh, I've sort of pitched this as a physics audience, so this is even way too mathematical already. Um, and I, I just don't want to talk about any of those things, uh, but we can do it privately or afterwards. Um, so the key observation that's going to lead us to a Rinkin's approach is a theorem of gates Gorey, which says that if you have um, smooth stacks X and Y in a closed embedding, uh, then you can compute two QCO of the formal neighborhood of Y inside of X as uh, the same thing as modules over the convolution algebra of quasi-coherent sheaves on X cross with X over Y. So we'll see some examples of this in, in a minute. Um, so for example, if I had zero sitting inside of A1, then the self-intersection is just the shifted affine line. Um, and that tells me that uh, two Q co on uh, the formal completion of A1 about zero 
um, is the same thing as categories with an action of quasi-coherent sheaves on the shifted affine line, which is just C adjoin epsilon mod, where epsilon is a variable of degree minus one. So that's, so that's like what gates Gorey's theorem would tell you uh, in this case. Uh, and then in general, like if your first infinitesimal neighborhood of X and Y is split, then you can identify this fiber product with the shifted normal bun with the minus one shifted normal bundle. Um, and then you find a, a similar thing where um, two Q co of the formal neighborhood of, sorry, X and Y is equal to quasi-coherent sheaves over the shifted normal bundle modules. Um, okay, so may, maybe I'll stop really quickly because that's a lot. Okay, so no questions, it seems. Um, so even though X and Y are assumed to be smooth, this fiber product X cross with itself over Y doesn't have to be. We've already seen that in this example here where we have zero cross with itself over A1 and we found this like uh, interesting derived stack, which is not smooth. Um, and so that means that much of the time, like we actually have a difference between QCO and INCO. Um, and so like in this particular example, like INCO, of the shifted affine line is actually equal to C adjoin Y modules, where Y is a variable of cohomological degree two. Um, so this is basically Kazool duality between the exterior and symmetric algebras, but it takes um, uh, but in order to get the full symmetric algebra, you have to take incoherent sheaves over the exterior algebra. And so then uh, if I want to generalize this to my second example, if I want to compute incoherent sheaves over the one sh minus one shifted normal bundle of X and Y, um, then that's roughly quasi-coherent sheaves on the two shifted normal bundle, uh, sorry, co-normal bundle of X and Y. Um, so I put quotes around this because it's not quite true because this two shifted, um, Conormal bundle is, is what's called a co-affine stack. Um, but if you um, if you think of like what you what a ring fun of if you if you take the ring of functions on this space and look at modules over that, you'll get the right answer. But that turns out to not be the same thing as plus coherent cheese. So that is a technical remark for the experts, but it doesn't, you won't go too far wrong by thinking of it as being. Uh, quasi-coherent sheaves, um, even though, again, it's not quite true. Um, sorry, but in particular, though, you see the, the appearance of the co-normal bundle, um, and this is what's going to lead just like some, to a symplectic geometry interpretation. Okay, so what uh, Arinkin's proposal says is that if I have a collection of closed embeddings of smooth stacks, um, such that the uh, disjoint union, the map from the disjoint union is surjective, then I can define a category which he calls two int co of uh, Y um, with singular support in lambda. So I'll explain what that means in a minute. Um, and that is defined to be uh, incoherent sheaves, or sorry, modules over incoherent sheaves on the fiber product of X with itself over Y. And so again, inco is not the same thing as QCO in the settings, this thing is big, or bit, you know, bigger than uh, just the ordinary quasi-coherent sheaves. Um, and this, uh, and the scheme lambda is uh, defined to be the union of the co-normal bundles of all the Xi's into Y sitting inside of the uh, two-shifted cotangent bundle of X. And we should think of this as, oh, sorry, that should be two-shifted cotangent bundle of Y. Um, and we should think of this as being a Lagrangian skeleton. 
And then there's also a small version, which I'll sometimes use with, um, where like instead you just use modules over coherent sheaves on the fiber product. Um, and as long as you're like working with small categories, you can take in completion and get the big thing back. Um, but I'm just gonna move uh, between them without a lot of um, fanfare. So my proposal, or not my proposal, Rinkin's proposal, is that uh, this 2Q co of Y with singular support in Lambda should be thought of as a Z-graded lift of um, a piece of the KRS category, um, which I'll call KRS T star Y uh, with singular support in Lambda. Uh, so this thing like has not been defined by any physicists, but uh, it's kind of just a, some piece of the KRS category. Um, and so it's a little bit unclear uh, like what this lambda should be physically. Um, when mass and FI parameters are in the picture, I can usually choose lambda to be the attracting set uh, for uh, the C star action determined by the mass parameters. And that's what I'm going to do in the future. Um, and sometimes actually I might just take the union of a lot of attracting sets for different, for all the possible masses. Um, and that turns out to be uh, convenient theoretically. But like I, I think that like this is something that like just does not really appear in um, in the Kapustin story in the same way that physicists don't really think about constructible sheaves with singular support. Uh, like they prefer to have like an LG model or something like that instead. Um, but I'll just let it be. Okay, so let's do an example. Um, these are the only two examples that you need to understand in order to understand everything. Um, and so the um, so the first example is the free hypermultiplet T star A1. And so if you look at its um, attracting sets, like based on uh, what Matt told you, when the mass is positive, when the real mass is positive, then your attracting set is the zero section. And when your real mass is negative, then your attracting set is the co-normal, or sorry, is the cotangent fiber to zero. So I'm just gonna make my, uh, for my purposes, I'm gonna throw together my Lagrangian skeleton to just be the union of these two things. So it's basically a coordinate cross. Um, sorry, let me draw a picture of that. So this is basically just the coordinate cross inside of A1. And then the corresponding map X in this scenario uh, is gonna be um, the map from the disjoint union of A1 and the origin to A1. And then you can compute the fiber product. And what you find is, uh, I like to think of this thing as kind of like a matrix. So if I compute the fiber product of A1 with itself over A1, I get A1. If I can compute the fiber product of zero with itself over A1, I get the shifted affine line. And then if I compute either the other two fiber products, I get just uh, the point zero sitting inside of A1. And then I can take int co of this thing. And basically what you get is just kind of like a, a matrix whose entries are monoidal categories or whose diagonal entries are monoidal categories and whose um, off diagonal things are modules. But anyway, it's, this is a very handy way of thinking about this thing. So using what we talked about before, uh, we can think quasi-coherent sheaves on A1 is just quasi-coherent sheaves on A1. Quasi-coherent sheaves on the point zero is just backed, backed. Uh, but then quasi but then uh, incoherent sheaves on the uh, only singular guy in the picture, um, the shifted affine line, that thing is this thing that I was calling quasi-coherent sheaves on the two-shifted line. So basically modules over this guy, C, C, adjoin, C adjoin U. or see a joint Y, I think is what it's called, where, this, where the degree of this thing is two. Oh, sorry, that was the wrong spot. Okay. okay, so any questions about this first example? Okay, guess not. Um, so let me move on to the second example. Um, and so for the second example, let me consider a gauge type or multiplet. So I'm looking at the cotangent bundle of A1 mod GM. Um, 
And in that case, basically I can choose roughly the same Lambda uh, where uh, I just take, or I take the Lambda I had before and just mod out by GM. So in this case, my, uh, my X is BGM, or sorry, is uh, A1 mod GM disjoint union BGM mapping to A1 mod GM. Uh, this is my X, this is my Y. And then I can take the same uh, fiber product and like it's a matrix as before and the only difference is everything gets modded out by GM. Uh, so it's exactly the same. And when I take inco, everything turns out exactly the same except for like everything uh, has an additional action of GM on it. Okay, so some interesting things to note is that in this case, uh, Lambda gives the whole space. So like this uh, seems to be kind of useful. Um, the other thing is that you can upgrade uh, this guy to an object of something that people call three QCO of BGM, which is QCO of BGM mod mod. So this thing is like a three category. Um, living over BGM. So this thing's like pretty weird. Uh, but concretely what that means is that uh, there are natural maps from A1 mod GM to GM and from A1 shifted by minus one mod GM to BGM. And so you can basically pull back along those maps to get a copy of QCO BGM living along the diagonal of this matrix algebra. And if you remember like that sort of additional uh, structure, uh, then like it turns out that that's exactly what you need to upgrade this thing to a, a object of three QCO. Um, and physically what this is, is that that's going to correspond to upgrading this thing to a boundary condition for B twisted um, 40 uh, U1 gauge theory. And in fact, like there's actually like an analog of ungaging that you can do uh, just like in this uh, example that we looked at before where we were looking at two QCO of BG. And if you try ungaging in this three category and you apply that to this gauge hypermultiplet, you actually just recover this free hypermultiplet. I um, mean, so in some sense, like this uh, lambda that I chose here was actually the biggest one that I could have chosen uh, that would be compatible with uh, gauging and ungaging. Um, so in some sense, like that gives you some reason that this is actually like a really good Lagrangian to choose. Okay, so questions about that. So that was a lot. Okay. So now we kind of understand the 3D B model in the only two cases of the 3D B model and in fact the 4D B model. Uh, in uh, the only cases that we'll actually need to understand. But now I'd like to move on to the 3D A model. And sadly, the 3D A model is kind of worse. Um, so the physical work that had been done is uh, in some papers of Kapustin bias and some papers of Kapustin bias and Setter. And they basically defined like what the field theory was but they only examined like the boundary conditions uh, in a very limited setting. So they basically examined the boundary conditions when you're looking at pure U1 gauge theory. And then also when you're looking at like a, a periodic hyper, like a hyper valued in R3 times S1. Um, and uh, that's not gonna be really enough uh, for my purposes. Um, but the next big work on the 3DA model is Telemann's ICM address. And he basically generalized this Kapustin bias um, setter story by studying the A twist of pure G gauge theory. And he defined the two category of boundary conditions for um, 3D pure G, B, sorry, A twisted 3D pure G gauge theory to be what I'm going to call. Um, GCAT, um, and that's going to be the two category of categories equipped with a Betty G action. And I'm going to think of this as something like the two Fakaya category of T star BG. Uh, that's just purely notation. There is no such thing as the two Fakaya category, but I prefer to have like a symplectic notation 
um, as opposed to a um, as opposed to something uh, different. Um, and he also proved the following version of 3D mirror symmetry, which was pretty amazing. So he proved that the two Fakaya category of T star BG was isomorphic to two quasi co uh, of a certain Lagrangian. Um, and that Lagrangian is living inside of the Coulomb branch of pure 3D gauge theory. So it lies inside the Atiyah Hitchin manifold. And basically, this Atiyah Hitchin manifold has like a natural um, some uh, Lagrangian vibration. And uh, there's a certain like distinguished um, point in there. And this Lagrangian is the fiber. Uh, like of this interval system. Um, sometimes people call this thing the core of the Coulomb branch. And what Telemann managed to show is that it, his two Fakaya category of T star BG is the same thing as uh, sheaves of categories living on this Lagrangian. Uh, here it's just ordinary quasi coherent sheaves of categories. We're not uh, doing this fancier Arrhenkin thing. Um, and then he basically gave some suggestions about how one ought to generalize this to something that involves the full uh, KRS um, theory of the Coulomb branch, but to my knowledge, no one's been able to make these precise. Um, and in the abelian case, he also proved the other direction uh, where uh, if you have the two Fakaya category of GM, um, I can tell you about this if you want, but I'll just skip it. And that's the same thing as 2 QCO of BGM. So, and this was an example that was considered by a Kapustin bias and setter. So anyway, so basically Telemann generalized their work quite a lot. So before I move on, let me actually uh, explain like Telemann's construction of Betty G actions on infinity N categories, or I guess I'm gonna generalize it. So he told, how, told us how it should act on one category, and I'm gonna tell you how it should act on any infinity n category. So I'm gonna define um, an infinity one category that I'll call BG, which has a single object, and then it has a simplicial set, or it has a topological space of Homs, or of endomorphisms of that single object, which are G, which is, and then the composition law is given by the, the um, group structure on G. And then one can define something called G uh, N cat, which is gonna be Homs in N plus one cat um, from BG uh, to N cat. Um, and so this thing, since it's a Hom in N plus one cat, like it is itself an N category. And the, the objects in this thing are basically an object in N cat together with a map from uh, the space S1 into the endomorphisms uh, of C. Um, and so now I just wanna say, uh, really I wanna actually consider the stable version of this where I always linearize at the topmost level. So basically if I'm looking at um, uh, you know, zero categories, I'm not gonna look at spaces, I'm gonna look at chain complexes or vect. Um, if I'm looking at one categories, I'm going to look at stable one categories. If I'm doing two categories, they're going to be two categories enriched in DG categories, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not going to really like talk all that much about that. Um, this means that actually you have to linearize BG, which I'll talk about in some examples, but I'm not going to try and define it in general here. And then uh, as um, Pranav asked, I'm basically just going to ignore issues of size slash presentability the whole the whole time. So basically there are like sort of some dumb size issues which are not important and then issues of presentability which actually are important but I just don't want to talk about it. Um, okay, so with those caveats in mind, let me tell you what this thing reduces to um, when n is equal to zero. So when n is equal to zero, I'm looking for um, an object of zero cat, which I said I was gonna consider the stable version. So I'm looking at, so C is really some uh, chain complex. Um, and then I wanna map from S1 into endomorphisms of C. So again, this is some chain, some uh, DGA. And then uh, the map that I wanna consider 
so I want to consider a map from S1 into these endomorphisms of this chain complex. And because this is linear, I can linearize S1 first uh, to its chains. And so what this thing ends up being is an E1 map from chains on S1 into endomorphisms on C. So what we found is that G0 cat, or at least the stable version, is basically equal to modules over um, I guess here I did it for S1. I could have done it for any any group. Um, but for this thing, I did that it's just modules over chains on S1, where that's equipped with the Pontryagin product. Um, so then the second example is the one Telemann considered. So here you want you have a category, an infinity one category, um, and a stable one. And you want to consider a map from S1 into the endomorphisms of this infinity one category. So the first thing is that there's a special point one inside of S1. And um, you want that to get sent to, um, to the identity functor of C. And then for every loop inside of, um, yeah, sorry, I don't know why I chose S1. Um, let me call this thing G. Um, so then for every loop inside of G, now you want to get an endomorphism of the identity functor. And because this thing is linear, again, I can factor um, my based loops in G. I can factor it through chains on the base loop space. Um, and it turns out that if you work out the compatibilities that this thing actually has to have, well, this is uh, an E, um, an E2 algebra, and this is an E2 algebra, and this thing has to be an E2 map. And then Telemann's theorem actually follows from the fact that chains on the base loop space of G is isomorphic to functions on this Lagrangian that I was referring to um, in the other uh, in the other talk or, or a little bit earlier. So there was this Lagrangian I was talking about, um, and, and basically once you know that this ring is isomorphic to this ring, uh, then everything just follows. Okay, so maybe I'll stop for a second before I go to n equals two. Okay, time to go to n equals, oh, sorry, yes? Perhaps I can ask a question. Um, when you're talking about these groups, you're working with topological groups at this point? Yeah, basically this can, this construction can, uh, because like all I did, I turned it into an infinity one category. Mm -hmm. Like all, I just, yeah, all I'm remembering is it's topological type. Um, yeah, so this is a very, this is a very topological theory. So G can be any loop space really, right? Uh, I mean, you need an, just need that it's an E1. Uh, absolutely, but like, uh, you know, I, I had a, just an example in mind. Um, yeah, I, I'm not really going for maximal generality. It's already too much. I just want to understand what the idea is, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. so all, all you need is that, uh, that yeah, that it be um, the, the uh, delooping of something. which I guess is something like being like a pointed group-like monoid or something. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so now I just really quickly like want to talk about the three categorical version, sorry, the two cat the N equals two uh, example of this construction um, and then the uh, which ends up being three categorical Betty Langlands. Um, so basically there's, uh, you know, through this thing, so I only really know what to do in this case when my group is uh, abelian. Uh, I guess I have like a little bit of idea of what to do when it's a general group, but like I don't have a theorem. So the only, so I'm just gonna consider when my group is abelian. So then I define something which I called S1 two cat. Um, I haven't like actually like computed that uh, for you. Uh, and I've also defined this weird thing that I called three co of BGM, which again was Q co of BGM mod mod. 
Um, and I claim that in fact, it's very easy to see that these two categories are the same. Um, and that this symmetry basically exchanges gauging and ungauging. Um, and so I'll say a word about the, the proof. And if I have more time, maybe I'll uh, come back for it, but um, I have very little time left as far as I can see. But basically what you need to do is uh, you need to think of this category BS1 and try and turn it into a stable two category. So like basically you're gonna linearize like at the top level. And it turns out that this thing is exa basically exactly, or sorry, uh, my, it's kind of obnoxious. So I was talking about, sorry, it should be three stabilization. Turn it into a stable three category. And it turns out that this is uh, exactly the three category with one object and one morphism associated to the symmetric monoidal category QCO BGM tensor. Um, uh, basically, like the key thing is just that there are uh, n loops, or that the fundamental group of S1 is uh, the integers, and the number of representations that you have of GM is also the integers, and these things match. Like basically like that's what this whole thing comes down to is that pi one of GM equals Z is also the character lattice of GM. Um, you have to do like a slight bit more work than that, but like uh, if you check the check the levels, like this is, th th basically this is not a deep theorem. This is something that's extremely easy uh, to prove. Assuming I stated it right. Okay. So we'll use this later. All right. But that's like the state of the knowledge. Uh, that was the state of the knowledge like before I uh, got involved. Um, and basically one of the things that's a real pain um, is that it's really hard to get any version of the two Fakaya category of T star A1 that isn't trivial. Um, and the reason is, is that, you know, T star A1 is a contractible space and uh, like it's very, very difficult to get anything like interesting out of it. But if you choose a Lagrangian skeleton, then you can like make, make it real or then you can make it be interesting. So again, I'm going to choose uh, the same Lagrangian skeleton that I've been choosing before. Uh, I'm going to choose uh, the coordinate cross inside of T star A1. Uh, the union of the zero section and the co-normal, sorry, and the cotangent fiber to zero. And now, like the thing that I want to try and figure out is what is the two Fakaya category of T star A1 with um, singular support being this coordinate cross? So there are two obvious candidates. So the first one is called constructible sheaves of categories um, on A1, and then let me call the, the stratification of A1 into um, a point in the complement of the point S. So one, one possible definition is constructible sheaves of categories on S. The other one is something that's called perverse Schober's on, on the stratified space uh, A1 comma S. So um, I'll give you the definition. So the constructible sheaves of categories um, is just defined to be the hum in infinity two categories, uh, you know, again, stable, and in, these, in the appropriate way between something called the exit path uh, category, which is defined by Truman and Lurie uh, to um, stable one categories. So that's, so that's one definition. And this definition has the nice property that it makes sense for any conically stratified space. Um, and so that means that it's defined in great generality, um, but it turns out that it's the wrong answer. Um, and the better answer is these perverse Schobers, which I'll denote by two perv of A1S. I mean, these were defined by Kapranov and Schechtman, uh, but sadly, like these things do not make sense in very many situations. Uh, so there's like a whole industry of trying to define like what perverse Schobers should be in various um, examples. 
Um, but in fact, like almost none of the examples that they have are, are ones that show up in 3D mirror symmetry. So they're really interested, uh, especially in doing things like, um, or sorry, at least in this context in 3D mirror symmetry. But they're really interested in things like doing the two Fakaya category of like T star of a surface to, of, of a curve together with, you know, some fixed number of singular points or things like a, a hyperplane arrangement. Um, and like other than like this one example, uh, none of the things I'm interested in come from a hyperplane arrangement. So it's good that this thing is that this thing was defined and that this is the answer, but it's bad because we're not going to be able to prove any more theorems after this one that I tell you, or at least not without doing a lot more work. Um, okay, so let me tell you really quickly uh, just about the idea that does not work, uh, just because it's pretty. Um, so if you have a uh, stratified space uh, X, S, then uh, a path gamma from the interval to X has what's called the exit property with respect to S. If for all um, points T naught less than T1 in the interval, the dimension of the stratum containing gamma of T naught is less than or equal to the dimension of the stratum containing gamma of T1. So one example of an exit path would be uh, if I had say uh, the, the plane with its coordinate uh, cross stratification. So I could start at the origin. I could travel along um, one of the um, coordinate axes and then I could leave uh, to go to the generic stratum. And you'll notice that like my, uh, the dimensions of the strata I'm in is just constantly increasing is I'm going from zero to one to two. So this one has the exit property, but a bad path would be something like starting at the origin, leaving to the generic stratum and then trying to come back to the origin. And this thing's like disallowed because I would try, I would have dimensions zero to zero. So that doesn't have the exit property. Um, and so one can generalize this to um, like what it means for a simplex to have the exit property. And then you can define an infinity one category, um, which is contained inside uh, the infinity groupoid associated to X, which we call sing or the singular simplices. And you just restrict to all simplices that have the exit property. And then you can show that it's a quasi category. Um, and then, so then there's a theorem like due to Truman, which says that if you do this in the zero context, if you look at Holmes from the exit path category into vect, and that's just the same thing as constructible sheaves on X. So if I did this for my uh, example, uh, where I have A1 uh, stratified uh, by the origin, then uh, this, if I take pi one of this exit path category, then basically what I get is, a, is something that has up to equivalence, it just has two objects, which will be the origin and any point not in the origin, let's say one. Then there's a morphism from zero to one called alpha and a morphism from one to itself called beta. And then beta has all of its composites. Uh, so you have like a whole full integers worth here. And then there's the relation in the category that alpha, you can basically find a um, nice two simplex, um, X at two simplex that shows that alpha is homotopic to beta composed with alpha. Um, so you get this little groupoid um, and so if I want to describe a constructible sheaf, I can just put a vector space on each of these objects and then choose maps satisfying this property. And that'll end up giving me a, uh, yeah, and beta needs to be, you know, invertible. Um, and that'll end up giving me a constructible sheaf. Um, and then like one can just generalize this by just looking at morphisms from this exit path thing into stable categories. Um, and this gives you some kind of notion of two constructible sheaf, um, some, some sort of constructible sheaf of categories, but unfortunately it's no good, or it's not good for my purposes. Okay, so the better example um, is if you take um, perverse sheaves, so uh, remember that the way that these things arise is if you look at the derived category of constructible sheaves on a uh, stratified space, then basically it has a heart, which is just uh, like um, 
the ordinary constructible sheaves, not complexes. Um, but it also has an alternate T structure whose heart is um, the perverse sheaves. And the perverse sheaves have a really nice description due to McPherson and Valonen, uh, which is that you can describe a perverse sheaf on uh, the line stratified at a, you know, with a single point as being two vector spaces, phi and psi, together with maps var and can going between them, such that one minus var composed with can and one minus can composed with var are both invertible. Um, and so this is like the example that like we're actually uh, uh, going to use. And uh, you know the definition due to uh, Kapanov and Shekman is that a perverse Schober is the same thing as a spherical functor. And a spherical functor is defined in the following way. Uh, a functor from phi to psi is spherical is it if it has a right adjoint such that the twist functors T phi and T psi. So let me explain what these things are. So basically you have a co-unit uh, going from the identity on phi to R composed with S and you can take its fiber or you have um, the co-unit from S composed with R to one psi um, and you can take that thing's co-fiber and you get these two interesting um, auto equivalents or sorry, auto or endo functors of phi and psi respectively. And I wanna ask that they both be invertible. Um, and so that's exactly analogous. Uh, to, so basically these twists basically are exactly analogous. So this thing would be, um, this one would be T psi. Uh, sorry, let me write in white. So this thing would be T psi. This one is T phi. And basically I'm asking that they both be invertible um, in order to get a perverse sheaf. And I'm asking for the exact same um, same construction here. Um, okay, so that's like the definition of like what a spherical functor is. Um, some interesting facts about them is in fact, a spherical functor has an infinite sequence of adjoints. Um, which is kind of cool. Um, and then the other like useful fact is in fact, uh, the spherical functor intertwines the, uh, the twists. Um, so I'll use that in a second. Um, but one can actually upgrade these things to a stable infinity two category um, by looking at the two functor category from uh, the, what's called the walking adjunction, uh, which is defined by Rel and Verity into stable categories. So basically there's some interesting um, two category such that functors from that two category into an arbitrary two category like gives you um, adjunctions or the objects of that category or a jump uh, uh, of that mapping space or adjunctions. Um, and then like uh, because it's a mapping category it has an obvious uh, uh, notion of morphism. And then you can actually just find uh, the perverse Schobers inside as a full subcategory. Um, and one place where you can see this done is in Dicker, Hoff, Kapanov, Schechtman, and Soibelman. Um, so this is going to be the two category that, uh, that we were going to use. Um, when we started this project, that paper hadn't came out. So we basically just repeated a bunch of the stuff they did. Um, but um, this is, but yeah, it's, they did it but you can read about it now without waiting for us. Um, okay, and then the uh, and then property two actually implies that you can upgrade perverse Schobers on A1 uh, with the stratification to an object of S1 to cat. Um, and this actually just categorifies the natural uh, way that, S, that uh, the S1 action on perverse sheaves manifests, um, is that basically it gives, it's given by composing with the twists on both sides. So that's like something that's pretty useful. Okay, so I'm basically out of time. So let me state my state the theorem that we proved. Um, and this is kind of where I figured I'd get to. Um, I'll I can tell you a little bit about the proof in the overtime. 
But so basically the, uh, so the thing that we've proved is that um, using the Arinkin uh, on SOTS, one can make sense of the KRS category, or sorry, one can define the KRS category of T star A1 mod GM with respect to this uh, cross Lagrangian uh, via the Arinkin definition. And then one can define the two Fakaya category of T star A1 uh, with uh, uh, support or with, with Lagrangian skeleton given by the cross uh, as two perverse, as a perverse showers. And then the first thing that we show is that in fact, these two, uh, two categories are equivalent. The second thing we show, which I've sort of mentioned as we've gone along, is that you can actually upgrade both of these things to objects in, um, in either 3Q COA BGM or S12 CAT. And under, and I've shown that these two things are equivalent. And under that equivalence, these two guys get swapped. So uh, if you're a physicist, basically what we've done is we're, we're looking at the, you know, the hypermultiplet with U1 flavor. These two things are the 4D surface operator, or sorry, uh, the 4D category is assigned to a point. And then this is S duality and we're seeing that they're exchanged. Um, Sam talked a lot about that in the, uh, if you were looking at a, the one category is assigned to a circle instead. Um, and then from this, I mentioned that gauging and ungaging get exchanged. So that means you can immediately get a, um, uh, the other equivalents out of it. So basically uh, the, this KRS category of T star A1 um, with uh, singular support Lambda, that thing made sense on its own. This two Fakaya category, there wasn't um, a, this equivariant two Fakaya category didn't make sense, but you can define it to be um, given by gauging the S1 action on perverse Schobers. Um, so that's what this guy is. Um, and then like basically through like just some general nonsense, you see that uh, this theorem immediately implies this theorem. Um, and then in fact, actually you can do this more generally for like, you can just take products of any number of copies of these primitive, primitive theories um, and then they'll be, be matched. Um, so that like, it lets you uh, like handle like an, arb like an arbitrary, uh, and in fact, you can handle um, an arbitrary Torres acting on, um, on, on linear matter. Uh, so that's no problem. Uh, but again, you'll have this generalization of this cross Lagrangian. We'll just take the product uh, of the cross Lagrangians to get a Lagrangian in the product. Um, so that's, um, so that like is kind of nice. Uh, and then something that's more interesting that I know that I wouldn't get any time to talk about is that this thing isn't really what you want physically. Like usually what you would want is not to be looking at stacks and you would also want, and in the physical answers, people usually have way less components in their Lagrangian than we have. So basically what we uh, prove is that deleting components from your Lagrangian is uh, dual to passing to uh, an open subset. And this like uh, basically lets you impose stability conditions um, and show like which components you should need to delete from the Lagrangian on the other side in order to make that work. So this like lets us get like the more usual physical statements. Um, uh, but anyway, so that's uh, so that's like roughly uh, like what we've done. I'm sorry I didn't get to say a word about this proof, but I figured mainly I just wanted to motivate the statement. Um, anyway, so I'll stop. Oh. Um... Thank you for your really interesting talk. Um, and um, now let's open the floor up for questions. Okay, so um, Pranav has a question, so. Um. Uh, thanks, Justin, for a great talk. So um, first, maybe this is a question and a comment. So the statement, so you're dealing with perverse showbers on C with the stratification given by just one point at the origin and the complement, right? Yes, absolutely. So essentially your theorem is a, is a statement just about a, a single spherical functor. That's it's correct. An alternative description of what a spherical functor is. Yeah, so it's an alternate description and basically what it is and the other description is that it's the same thing as a category uh, with an action of this um, matrix algebra. Uh, 
where is it? Sorry. Th this uh, matrix algebra here. Right. And now you're saying you can go to the more general abelian case. Just by taking uh, basically products. Um, so in this setting, you just take up products or, or you, know, you just pass all these things to A1 mod GM to the N. Right. Um, uh, like, a, and these things become BG GM to the Ns. Um, and then basically like you get this weird, uh, and then basically what you're getting is the category of perverse Schobers um, like based on, on AN with the product stratification. Okay, so that's one. Is that one of the cases where Schober? I mean, so Schobers are defined on for surface human surfaces with Mark and, and they're defined on certain hyperplane arrangements. Hyperplane arrangement. So this falls under the second. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, although, like, I think that we could, we would just, uh, we could also just say that there's like a combinatorial, or like a there's just a, a definition you could also make uh, of just like defining it to be products of spherical fun like like a product Combinate. operation. Right. Um, but yeah, so, so the, and like the whole theorem, uh, maybe I'll say like one word about the proof. So the way that this th thing goes is that like, if you think about perverse Schobers, if you want to try and like actually um, understand this category, the thing you use is that this thing has two different categories, two different functors to vect, um, which are basically given by um, uh, the first phi and psi. And then you can basically show that the projective objects uh, represent these functors. So then you can sort of get this, uh, this uh, description as just being, uh, uh, you, take the, you take the sum of the two objects that represent phi and psi and compute their self endomorphisms. And then everything will just be a module over that. And that just reproduces for you these quivers. So basically like the hard work is that you need to show that these two functors are, are representable. So they're exact functors. Um, so if they're representable by an object, they'll be represented by a projective object. And I should say here that you need to allow phi and psi, to get the representing object, you need to allow uh, non-finite dimensional um, vector spaces for phi and psi. Um, and basically we just do the exact same thing. So we, so in perverse Schobers, you've basically got, um, for, sorry, in spherical functors, you basically have something that's like, remember the source, remember the target. And then basically we try and find like a particular object, uh, that represents each of these functors. And, uh, the one that re represents the source, um, Uh, the thing that takes phi s psi to phi uh, is actually just uh, the standard adjunction between q co of a1 mod gm and q co of bgm, which is just uh, restriction at the origin. I see. So, like that, that was like really cool, uh, and it's like actually like very concrete. Um, like how if you have another spherical functor and you have an object in the in the source category, uh, like basically like uh, Benji and I have this really dumb proof about like how you would construct the functor uh, that would uh, show that this thing was representable. But obviously when you're working with infinity categories, you can't do anything via um, just writing down formulas. Yeah. So basically there's like a really obvious formula that like tells you that this thing is correct. Um, basically what you, the thing that you need to notice is that this thing is basically just generated by twists of a single object. Mm -hmm. um, and basically that there's a, you know, and, and whatever the map is um, from one to the twist. So there's some map here, which corresponds uh, like in this model, this thing is the structure sheaf and this thing is the structure sheaf with grading shifted by one. It's just the coordinate function. Um, so anyway, so like basically this category is just totally determined by the twists. Like uh, there's just like, there's no, there, there's just like one object. It's just freely generated by twists under that object and, and this canonical morphism that must exist from one to the twist. And then you just say like, okay, well if I have some other, so if I have an object in phi, 
just send my, the structure sheaf of A1 mod GM to that object, send um, you know, all the grading shifts of the structure sheaf to just twists of that object, and then just fill in, uh, like this morphism X just goes to the canonical morphism from one to T. And like, you just like say like, okay, so that should be the answer. Um, and then it's just like very difficult to just actually show that you did all your infinity category stuff right, that, uh, that this was actually um, possible. Yeah. Um, but basically like the idea is really dumb. Like it's so dumb that we're surprised nobody thought of it before. Uh, but then, but like actually doing it of course is like much harder. Like we ended up having to do some like horrendous computations with some plushal sets. Um, like we needed to show, we need to compute the, somewhere we had to compute the localization of some category at some uh, class of morphisms, which like don't form an or set. And like, we needed to show that that thing stayed a category. And that like, that's like where all the work actually was. Um, but so there's like, so basically there's just this really dumb idea. And then you have to like do a ton of, um, like a ton of, uh, you know, homotopical work to make it true. Right. Thanks. I think there's other questions. Okay. There. Yeah. I think Aswin has a question. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah. Hi, Justin. So I had a very simple question. So uh, the choice of S, uh, strat choice of a stratification, uh, mm -hmm. how does that uh, affect? The choice of the Lagrangian skeleton in what you wrote. It seems like those are somehow related. Uh, yeah, they're exact. So the so the Lagrangian skeletons that I'm considering are only ones that are given by taking co-normals of closures of strata. So so the ones that I all, all, all the ones that I considered right was just like you have a one, you have zero, and you have the complement of zero. So okay. then uh, so that that's my stratification, and then you could take the co-normal to zero, which is you know the cotangent fiber. And then you could take, you know, the co-normal to the closure of the zero section, and that's just the zero section again, and that's my lambda. So it's just there's a standard dictionary for passing between passing from a stratification to a skeleton. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and uh, so uh, I, I don't know uh, anything about this notion of a perverse Schrober, but is there any sort of intuition as to why they are defined only for these particular things? I mean, the theory of perverse sheaves exists very generally, right? So why this peculiar? Uh, so in order to like write down perverse Schober's, you need to have an explicit computation of your category of perverse sheaves in terms of like a quiver. And then like once you like have like a quiver represent, like you, you need an explicit quiver presentation and it has to be like a kind of a nice quiver presentation. And once you have that, then you can just categorify all of the um, vector spaces become categories, all of the uh, maps in your quiver become functors, uh, satisfying like some, some properties where you ask for various things to be invertible. Um, but uh, like there's only a limited number of spaces where people have actually um, computed those quivers. Uh, and then the other problem is, is that like, if I wanted to do this for a general, most of the interesting examples in um, 3D mirror symmetry arise like as gauge theories. And like, basically there's no, like basically like I was able to, you know, gauge this, like understand what the gauged uh, uh, answer would be in this for a U1 symmetry. But like, I would, like, I have no idea how to gauge perverse Schober's for like a general G symmetry or I have some ideas, but it's too hard. Uh, to like actually do anything with. Um, and, and so like I, basically. And this quiver has nothing to do with the quivers that are associated to quiver gauge theories or anything. Like no, no, no. The quiver that I was looking at was this quiver here. Like in my example, it was this quiver. Basically like, like a perverse sheaf is a two vector spaces together with a map this way and a map that way, uh, such that these two things are invertible. Like that was the description I needed to do this. So I have S and R. So those are maps going in the two directions. And I just ask for something, some things to be invertible. So basically like what you need is like this category of, you have to like find generators for like this quiver category. And then you need to like compute their endomorphisms uh, in order to get, get the, sorry, this perverse sheaf category and you compute their endomorphisms to get some quiver. 
So yeah, so the quiver is the quiver that you get by computing endomorphisms of projectives, like in perverse sheaves. Okay. I think Chris has a question. Hi, Justin. I think you may have already mostly answered my question in your answer to Ashwin just now. Um, I was going to ask which parts of the construction do you know how to generalize to a non-median group and which parts is only currently makes sense for you one, but I, I, I would maybe say we'll answer that a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd say very the little. Category on the B side, the KRS category. It seemed like those constructions made sense generally. Is that true? Oh yeah, sure. The B side is very easy. The A side is where all of the hard work is. Yeah. Or I mean, sorry, the B side, all the definitions are kind of there. Uh, for although, like, it's unclear, like, also, like, what my choice of Lagrangian should be in more generality. Mm -hmm. Um. So, uh, like, in fact, like, uh, there's some secret mirror symmetry statements that I used to guess the way that this was going to go. Um, and like basically people don't have quite as good of an understanding of mirror symmetry for G GIT quotients for non-abelian groups. And so like one way that you could try and access this is by trying to study those in more detail. Um, in particular, you'd want to know about their A models, which is people don't, 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 don't do really at all. Thanks. Uh, actually, so if uh, physics has some intuition for what the natural stratification should be, uh, that would then give some idea of what the Lagrangian should be, right? If you follow the same sort of prescription, take conormals to strata. That's right. But in general, uh, yeah. And like I have, I, I mean, I have like an idea. Like, so my, my, so the way that I found it here is that just like when you turn on a mass parameter, like you get like a, you know, you get like a potential function and you can look at the attracting sets. Mm -hmm. And basically I just like took the union of all the possible attracting sets for every, like every chamber that the mass parameter could be in. And that was, that was my skeleton. Um, and, and the reason that I did this is because uh, the thing that I'm gonna do, the thing that I didn't talk about at all is that, um, then the, so I prove a theorem like with this huge skeleton that's way too big. And then on the other side, like basically things are way too stacky. And then the, then the theorem that we prove is uh, that if you want to impose a stability condition on the stacky, on like the stacky side or on either side that's stacky, that's like passing to some open subset and the functions that cut open that, cut that subset out you can use them to figure out a Lagrangian components of your Lagrangian on the other side that you're supposed to delete. And then you'll get a true statement. Like if you pass to the open subset and delete these components from the strata, it'll still be true. Or from, sorry, from the skeleton, it'll still be true. So like, that's the part that like, uh, it's actually not, it's not even very hard, but there's a lot of combinatorics you have to do. Um, and so like, basically that would be, that's what I would try and do is I would look at these attracting sets like the union of all these attracting sets for all the quiver gauge theories, like with all the different mass parameters. And then like what I, I think like people call these things like the Janus interface now because um, uh, Dedeschenko started studying them, but we've been looking at them for a long time in the math literature. Um, so you look at like the, like the Lagrangians coming from all these Janus interfaces for all the different mass parameters. And then, and then like you would yet yeah, look at the mirror uh, FI Janus interfaces which we also understand kind of. Um, so anyway, so there's like, there, there's like a picture that would make sense, but it's just like the A side is just way too hard. Uh, I, I have no idea what, so I kind of know what the stratification might be, but I can't like compute, get like a quiver presentation of that strata, like it, it, of those strata, like it, it might be actually like in some work of Ben Webster already, but I don't actually know that that's the right quiver. Like he has a quiver that he associates to O, but it's not the same one that I use, so. So, and do these strata have a simple relation to relationship to the kind of strata that uh, Ami Hanani was writing? Uh, like no, they're very some... different. They're very different. Okay. And in fact, like they're not strata, right? I mean, like it was strata in this case because I had a cotangent bundle, but in general, they're just like some Lagrangian submanifold. So, strata, like strata, is what I used here because that was convenient, but I wouldn't think of them as strata in general. 
Are there any further questions? Okay, well, I think we should um, thank Justin again and end it here.